morning all. I'd like to show you this morning a great game by Dr. John Nunn. Uh, John Nunn is one of my favourite British grandmasters. Uh, he wrote uh, many, many books like um, Nunn's Chess Openings. He's a fantastic problem solver, a world champion in problem solving. Uh, he's a fantastic mathematician. Uh, you can read a lot about him on actually the wiki uh, page for John Nunn. Uh, here is one of his uh, one of his most interesting games with the King's Indian Defence. So he's a major exponent of the King's Indian Defence. And by the way, on, on a personal note as well, he awarded me uh, my my title for for Lloyd's Junior Under 18 Champion back in 1989. I was really pleased to. That was a glorious day for me in my chess career back then. Uh, so John Nunn was black against a very strong uh, player, Alexander Belyavsky, here, who I think um, Kasparov had to uh, challenge in order to play uh, Anatoly Karpov for the 1984 match. So Alexander Belyavsky, one of the strongest players in the world around that time in 1985 in the Weekend Z tournament. So he plays the King's Engine defence against Alexander and we see here f3, the Simish variation. After castles bishop e3, this looks as though white will be adopting an aggressive plan like this to exchange off the dark square bishops and resume uh, and have good uh, attacking prospects. After knight bd7, queen d2, we see black trying to emphasize the dark squares in the position with c5. And now white plays d5, and this gives black a nice square for the knight, knight e5, which is played. But you might have second thoughts about doing this with black, because what about h3, and then f4, just kicking the beautiful knight on e5. Well, this is one of the reasons why this game um, is very, very interesting. White does play h3 just with the idea of kicking the knight, and maybe you know that would give White a nice square for his knight, and he can continue maybe um, with a plan in the center later, breaking for e5. John plays in this position, knight h5. Okay, so there's some ideas now, like knight g3 attacking the rook if f4 possibly, but we'll do a good inspection in the second pass of this game. For the moment though that did seem intuitively why white now decided to retreat the bishop back uh, to lend some support for that g3 square. Now black reacts very energetically here. John plays f5. Okay, and it looks as though, hold on a sec, is he really uh, going to take with a pawn, because clearly he can't take with a piece because of g4, right? And if he takes with a pawn, then maybe white just plays f4. Well, let's just quickly have a look at that. If white can just play f4 here, this knight goes back, and positionally this would be great, because look at this bishop hemmed in by that pawn, and then white's in a great position here, surely. But, and the big but here, black does play Rook takes f5. Okay, but here, surely g4 just wins a piece. It is indeed played, g4. Okay, black has a nice move here. Uh, he is going to lose that knight though, so it's a very dynamic, exciting position. White's king still in the center though, so factor that as well. Black plays rook takes f3. Now the knight cannot take here clearly because of check, full king, king and queen. So Alexander Bolyavsky, he plays g takes h5. Okay, and now a very, very nifty move is played in this position, which does many things. Puts more pressure on white, stops white casting queenside many functions with one move. I wonder if you can spot it. If I give you 10 seconds, we well, might want to pause the video.
Okay. John plays queen f8. Well, he's put pressure on f2. He's also implying bishop h6 is going to be useful for this diagonal. So although he's sacrificed the knight, the black pieces are springing into life. Look at this dynamism of the position. This beautiful knight on e5. You know, if the knight ever went here, then that would drop. So, um, potentially. So white tries knight e4. And then we see bishop h6. And the queen goes to c2. Okay. Now more pressure is exerted on white here. Ideally this, this pin looks quite tasty but uh, why not put more pressure on e4 first. This next move does that. Queen f4. Okay. And if bishop f5 is coming up how can white actually parry all this pressure? Alexander probably realizes he's in a difficult position here and tries a quite a committal move now. He plays knight e2. Although it's attacking the queen, it is allowing a potentially dangerous tactical idea, which is made use of now, of rook takes f2, pinning the knight to the queen. Uh, so that could be very, very bad <laughs> for white. But um, okay. Black is sacrificing the exchange though with knight takes f3. So what is John's point here? So he's sacrificed the knight and now he's sacrificed the exchange. His point is knight f3 check. Okay, forcing the king to move. And now queen h4 hitting the knight here and also preparing bishop f5 is very dangerous. There are numerous threats building up in fact. The Queen is striking many important squares here. White tries in this position knight d3. And then we see this nasty pin bishop f5. So there are numerous uh, threats. For example with this pin there's knight e1 even attacking uh, d3 and c2 protected by that Queen on h4. Uh, maybe even the rook can swing in. Uh, the queen's got loads of pressure basically from that position on h4. Also, if the bishop you know, moves, maybe knight d4 as well, hitting queen and knight just like that. Very difficult position. Alexander chooses knight e to c1. Okay. And now. We see quite an invasory move here. Knight d2. There's also, of course, now there's also the queen is also hitting h5 as well for this diagonal. Okay, it looks as though it's just so intense the pressure. The stumbling knights look worse than a Karpov Kasparov game from a World Championship match with the Kasparov Gambit. The knights and the king in the center. It just gives black uh, such an impressive looking position. White seems helpless visually. But uh, we'll, we'll see in the second part of the game what resources were available to white. It doesn't look as though intuitively there are going to be resources here because look at these rooks standing at base, bishops standing at base. The knights just holding on to each other and the queen and king don't look in a great position here. So anyway, white tries h takes g6 and that's simply recaptured for the moment, leaving white still with this horrendous looking position. Bishop g2. And now John wins a pawn with knight takes c4. Why not? Protected by the queen and threatening like you free check. It's brutal. A brutal looking position. Queen f2 to try and say Please get the queens off, but no. John plays knight e3 check. Not to king e2. The queen becomes aggressive now on c4. Queen c4 threatening. Things like queen c4 and all sorts of 
other things are potentially on the cards here. Okay, so white tries bishop f3. And now also this this is nice because the queen's on there, sensitive queen, rook f8. <laughs> now with, 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 with other threats like bishop e4 as well to factor in, as well as queen c2, it's uh, looking horrible. But rook g1 is played in the faint hope white might get something on the g file. Very unlikely here, it would seem. Knight c2 hitting the rook and introducing uh, well multiple threats like knight d4 again bishop e4 looks tempting but uh, what about this rook well white seems a bit um i think he i think he realizes uh, this is a, is a very bad uh position indeed and gives black multiple options again king d1 and here okay instead of taking the rook the, the knights on offer as well Bishop takes d3, and here Alexander resigns. 27 move win, showing <laughs> really a number of things. Perhaps not trying to win a knight on h5 isn't the best idea in the world sometimes. It really depends on the position, especially with the king in the center. And the rooks were, were made to be spectators. Most, most of white's pieces in this game were spectators. Uh, so, an innovative idea stemming from a, from the main central opening idea of the strong knight on e5, and white trying to intuitively dislodge it by playing for h3 and f4, and a resultant tactical disaster. Let's check that out. A second pass through this game. It's uh, plus 16, plus 19, plus 21 here. So let's give an example. Knight b3, offering the rook, will do. <laughs> that looks desperate to play rook g6, but if we could go for a same saner move in terms of material, rook takes f3 here, that looks good. Get the queen away from c2 maybe. Well, let's just go with this one. It's nasty. <laughs> so anyway, um, let's go through the game to see could white have improved here. So we have this nice knight on e5. And black actually, it looks as though the engine likes black here already, interestingly. Black has a slight advantage technically. So h3, now knight h5 is, is recommended by Houdini. Getting onto that g3 square. So white plays the logical bishop f2 to defend g3. And now we see this very energetic f5, which is not mentioned by Houdini. Well, <laughs> queen b6 and knight d7 at depth 16. Would f5 actually come up? Would it really? One of John Nunn's basically immortal games with the king's engine. Would f5 actually be mentioned? Depth 17? Nope, not yet anyway. So let's go with f5. So e takes f5 was supposed to give white an advantage because black was supposed to capture the pawn. Okay, e takes f5, but black captures, probably to the engine's horror, with the rook. And in fact, it's changed its tune that black is better after rook takes f5 at depth 16. It now changes its tune, being forced into this aggressive path with the king in the center to try and forcefully get the engine to take a piece. It doesn't mind rook takes f5 all of a sudden. All of a sudden we see black's better even after this move g4. So rook takes f3, g takes h5 and the key move queen f8. Black is actually technically better at this depth. Knight e4 is tried and that gives black nice position it looks as though queen f5 is also interesting but bishop h6 hmm is queen f5 actually more accurate what would be the idea let's say white castles queen side well actually no we've got to protect the knight pardon me <laughs> queen e2 check 
And why would this force Queen takes d3? Ah, because of the knight attacking f2 here as well. Alright, so forget Queen e2. What else? Let's say Knight g5. Here, in this position, a critical move is Rook f4, threatening just Queen g5. And if Knight e6 or something, as an example, just Rook f8, look at this treble battery on the f file. And here, trying to defend f2, Bishop h6, white is being overloaded systematically. He can't move, really. If Queen e2, Rook e4, and that's it's looking diabolical. So maybe there was a stronger continuation uh, than Bishop h6. Queen f5, interesting. <laughs> okay, so Bishop h6, and we saw Queen c2, which is supposedly about equal now. But Queen f4, it's still dangerous for white. Knight e2. And now black continued aggressively. So rook takes f2. Clearly, if knight takes f4, rook takes c2 is much better for black. So knight takes f2. And we see now this aggressive check, and black is getting the better of it, it seems, technically. Key move again, key move, queen h4. The queen is keeping an eye on many things. Three, three things. This diagonal potentially. F2, that that row, that fifth row. So white tries knight d3, and we see bishop f5, nasty pin. Pin and win. Knight ec1 looks unhealthy. What else could white have done? If he plays queen c3, now bishop g7. Let's try bishop g7, forcing move. Bishop takes d3. We're going to get into e1, I suspect. Check. Take the rook. Why not? And then black's great. Here. Okay. So this is showing unpleasantness. It looks intuitively very unpleasant. But um, the engine is really confirming it is as unpleasant as it looks. So hg, hg, and now bishop g2. Knight takes c4. Looks good. Fretting. The fork. So queen f2 check. And then this queen c4 is a very powerful move. Queen d4 is also a powerful move. Maybe a matter of personal preference here. So we see bishop f3. And now rook f8 exploiting that kind of weakness of the last move with this. Although white's trying to get something on the g file, it's, it's very, very optimistic from this sort of position to, to try and go for an attack. And it's really, it's really just all over here. Well, here I think it's around here that uh, White resigned. A real crush. One of John Nunn's immortal games. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. It shows really how dynamic chess can be, and how intuitive ideas. Well, when the king's in the centre. Intuitive ideas of kicking away a central knight with h3 and f4 as a plan might come off badly if the opponent starts sacrificing material to get at your king. Comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.